We are live on a Monday in Studio B. This is your day-to-day -day BYU Sports play-by-play. -play. I'm Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. Joining us now is ESPN college basketball insider, expert, and analyst Jay Billis is back on the program. Jay, great to have you back on BYU Sports Nation. How are you this morning? Doing great. How are you guys doing? You know, I wish we were discussing another we, BYU win, better. and the Cougars were 7-5 and five and had beaten the, uh, the Cowboys on the road, but they didn't. But still, we're looking big picture today. So, uh, how at this juncture, BYU 6-6 six and six in the toughest basketball conference in America, how would you assess what BYU has done in the Big 12 thus far? I think it's been great. I mean, I think most people expected it was going to be a rougher ride than this going uh, from one conference to another, especially going into what I consider to be the best conference in the country. So I think uh, marks, you know, it's been high marks for BYU uh, all the way around. And, and it's hard not to feel good about the resume when you look at it. Things still good. Certainly uh, trending in a certain direction. Defensively, BYU's not played great the last couple of games. Uh, but, you know, at Oklahoma State, uh, you know, other teams have lost there as well. Uh, how would you kind of summarize what, what that loss kind of meant on Saturday and where BYU needs to go from here? Well, I mean, any game on the road I think is difficult to win. But, uh, you know, even Oklahoma State, they haven't had as much success this year. Part of it's been some injuries they've had at given times, but they're just not as consistent. And people tend to forget you can have good teams that have less than stellar records because they're just not particularly consistent. That doesn't mean they can't play really well from game to game. And, you know, BYU, like a lot of teams, you know, BYU is different offensively. They, they uh are one of the best three-point shooting teams, if not the best three-point shooting team in the country. They actually shoot more threes than Alabama, which to a lot of fans would be really surprising. Uh, but they're not, you know, they're not a, a, a lockdown defensive team. They're good defensively, but that's not really, I wouldn't say that's their identity is to knock people's teeth in on the defensive end. So that doesn't mean they can't get significantly better uh, as we go through the season uh, toward the end. And, uh, but their offense is good enough to keep them in every game and, and have a chance to win. Jay Billis is with us on BYU Sports Nation. You had BYU at number 14 in your own personal rankings last week. So after a loss at Oklahoma State, how much does that impact BYU's resume and where they fall in your index right now? Not very much. It doesn't, it doesn't affect them that much at all. Um, you know, I think the, the issue is going to be there are a lot of teams that are kind of bunched up after you get past the top couple of seed lines um, in the, if you want to try to project out the tournament. And I think what the committee is going to ultimately wind up doing to tell them apart, unless you're, you know, parsing through a lot of tape like us idiots do, um, you're not going to be able to tell them apart. So what they'll have to do is just count count quality wins and then count quality road wins, things like that. The one thing the committee does that I think is stupid is they they parse non-conference schedules. And why do why do you care what non-conference schedule BYU played when they play this crazy hard conference schedule? You know, they say it's your overall body of work. So what difference does it make whether you challenge yourself in the non-conference? If you're challenged in your league and overall it gives you a competitive schedule with anybody else, I don't see why the committee should even factor that in. But, you know, nobody asked me. I, I just think that's <laughs> kind of dumb. Hey, Tom Homo, BYU's athletic director, used to be on the committee for a couple of years. It's been fun to gain his insights as to kind of what they look at on the team sheet and whatnot. And right now, BYU's team sheet uh, looking good. Certainly not playing on Sunday in the second round means there's only four spots BYU could go, Jay, and one of them is Salt Lake. BYU's really hoping they could get some kind of home court advantage there, and if so, they'd probably be a more weathered, experienced team than they've ever been having one year in the Big 12. Yeah, where they go doesn't really matter. I mean, it's just gaining entry and trying to get the best seed you can. Because uh, you can you can get the best possible seed, and so you know, last year Arizona is two, and they wind up getting a horrible matchup with a team like Princeton to have to try to guard that stuff. Um, and it, it gets really difficult with your second round matchup or your your second uh, second game in, in a weekend. You know, football has the luxury of at least one week to prepare for everything, and basketball doesn't get that. So you have to prepare for one game, then you got to turn around in a short time frame, and the players have to digest how to deal with a completely different opponent in a very short time period. So that puts some of the top seeds at, at some risk there. Jay, BYU hosts Baylor tomorrow, so not much time to dwell on the loss against Oklahoma State. <laughs> they have a top 15 team coming to the Marriott Center tomorrow. What do you expect in that matchup the second time these teams have met, but this time obviously BYU dealing with home court advantage? 
yeah, the, the, as you guys know better than, better than most, the uh, Marriott Center is a tough place to play. Uh, but, you know, Baylor's used to that. They, they play in tough places all the time. Um, it doesn't mean they're going to do well in that environment. Uh, but, you know, playing in Allen Fieldhouse and some of the places they have to play, I don't think it'll be quite as shocking to them. Like BYU, it, it may be the best atmosphere in the Big 12, but it's got some real competition at least. Um, and in, in their time in other leagues, uh, it's been the best atmosphere. Um, so I think I think Baylor will be will be a little bit more uh, used to that kind of thing, if you will. Uh, but Baylor's very good. They haven't shot the ball as well in Big 12 play as they did in non-conference play, but they're one of the best three-point shooting teams in the country. And uh, Jacoby Walter has started to find his range. He struggled a little bit uh, making shots early on in Big 12 play, and his numbers went way down. Um, and then Ray J. Dennis, who transferred in from Toledo, where he's Mac Player of the Year, is a, a really good point guard. And uh, they're legit. They're very good. And the guy that's really made a difference to them is uh, Eve Misi, uh, the freshman uh, from Cameroon. And uh, he's explosive and can block shots. And he's really, uh, really difficult to contain in pick and roll situations because he rolls so hard in the basket. So it'll be a challenge. But BYU is going to be able to spread them out. And uh, they can make shots from, uh, they must have five or six guys that have made 30 or more threes. So uh, they'll be a, a major challenge uh, to spread out that Baylor defense. Jay, most, most of the announcers that come into Provo, they say Marriott Center, and that quickly tells you, hey, you're not from here. You don't know how to say the name of the gym. You said Marriott, which is proper, so thank you for being one of us. I appreciate that. Well, that, that's not up to you. That's up to the Marriott people. <laughs> <laughs> If they're going to give me Marriott points for saying it the right way, I've not seen any benefit from it, so I might just say Marriott. Yeah, <laughs> come on. Give him some Bonvoy. Give, give him no, 100,000 points. No points. Why should I do it? Like, yeah. I, I actually played there when I was in high school. Did you they really? Used to have a, yeah, they used to have, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, and when I played AAU ball, there wasn't as much of that back then as there is now. But, uh, but I played against a lot of guys that went to BYU in L.A., and uh, friends of mine and all that stuff. Um, and uh, but yeah, we played a. It was called the BCI, you know, Basketball Congress International. I don't even know what the hell that meant. But, uh, <laughs> we, yeah, we, we played at BYU. I think it was honestly. I think that was the first time at that tournament that Duke saw me play, uh, where I ultimately wound up going. Uh, so I got I got recruited by a lot of places because of uh, because of that. And we also we, uh, there was nothing to do for us in uh, other than play basketball there. So we used to go to a bowling alley in Provo, and uh, and we called it the uh, uh, the CBI, the Provo Bowling Invitational. So we got a bunch of guys together to bowl. So we, we are expert bowlers in Provo. Yes. Very, very nice. Jay Billis, Provo Bowling Invitational champion, is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Uh, let's tack on some Marriott points for sure. Jay, I think the question is, when when can we get you back in the Marriott Center at any point to call a game or otherwise? Just call my bosses. I, I'd love to be there. Um, it's been a long time since I've been there. I've done some BYU games on the road, you know, in Maui and some different places, but I haven't had uh, I haven't had the chance to get back there in a while. Part of that was the conference affiliation thing for a little while, but now uh, now because of the Big Twelve, um, yeah, just just uh, just ring up my bosses and tell them. Tell him uh, I want to go because I want to go. Okay, the call the call is going in for sure. BYU versus Kansas next year. I'm calling it right now. <laughs> There will have to be some coffee shipped in, though. That, that's the, uh, oh, we, the only downside. We got you. <laughs> I think there are enough uh, things around campus that it's, can accommodate It's that. not just a bowling alley now, Jay. <laughs> we got you. Oh, All right, Jay. Uh, as far as BYU's resume goes, uh, your good colleague, Joe Lenardi, has BYU as currently a five seed. Maybe they drop a, a seed line after the loss to Oklahoma State. But in your realistic opinion, what's what's the ceiling for BYU? Where how high could they go without fully putting on these blue goggled lenses that sometimes BYU fans do? You know, I, I, I really don't know the answer to that. I mean, with all respect to what uh, Joe does and all these bracketologists, there's there's nothing I care less about than where somebody is today. <laughs> um, because, it, they, you know, they always say if it ended today, it doesn't end today. And that always puts uh, outcome over process. And the process is play the game in front of you and get better so that you're at your best in March. And that's what the coaches are saying. I mean, I, I don't think the teams are looking at this going. Uh, I know some of the coaches do look at this stuff for their own uh, edification, sort of the idea that, uh, hey, if we go three and two in this stretch, we'll be in better shape or this, this game means more. 
uh, for our resume. But the uh, the players, that doesn't get you any wins to focus on that stuff. It doesn't help you. And I'm more of a process guy. Um, but, but, look, the, the, the good news is BYU is really good. And I, I, I don't think there are very many teams out there, if any, that they cannot beat. It's just the, the list of teams that can beat them is probably a little bit longer because of the nature of this year. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly what it is uh, because we don't have all the data, but I tend to think the transfer portal especially and then NIL to some extent has spread talent around more, which is what I anticipated would happen and what every reasonable economist anticipated what would happen. And that's what most fans said they wanted. Um, so it's a little bit harder to tell uh, some teams apart resume-wise, and that's why for the committee it's going to come down to a counting exercise. Um, and I don't know, honestly, it should be any different because I'm not sure that, that I would trust uh, a committee to decide, well, they looked at us play and they think that another team's better than us. Uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather they do it based on, on how many games did you win, uh, against what quality competition, how many road wins, and then just slot it that way. That's a lot easier than trying to say, well, you know, Purdue's offense is really good against zone. Uh, I don't want them making that determination. You've uh, been outspoken over the years about different uh, NCAA issues and whatnot. What's sort of top of mind of, hey, we need to address this moving forward? Because there's a lot of discussion, obviously, about transfer portal, NIO, and whatnot. Conference, or, uh, expansion of the NCAA tournament is always discussed. What's number one on your agenda item of we need to address this? Well, I mean, if, if it's off-court issues, um, the NCAA is staring down some court cases that are going to cost them billions of dollars, and they're going to lose them. And to me, it's a no-brainer. The, the simplest and smartest thing to do running a multi-billion dollar entertainment industry is just take the restrictions off and tell these institutions you can pay whomever you want, whatever you want, in whatever fashion you want. And it'll be a recognized market. It won't be very difficult. They'll sign the players to contracts. If you can sign them to a letter of intent, you can sign them to a contract. It's not that hard. And coaches will say, well, it's transactional. It's always been transactional. You either offered a player a scholarship or offered them a walk-on position. They signed a letter of intent. It's not difficult. But if you sign them to a contract, you bargain with the player, and the player has bargaining rights, and, and they say, we'll pay you X amount of dollars. But we want a buyout in the contract. We want a provision that says if you become academically ineligible, the contract's terminated. If you get arrested or run afoul of the law, the contract's terminated. Things like that. And there can be player protections in there. If the player wants health care or something like that, you can bargain for it. It's not that difficult. And, uh, you know, it works for the rest of American society. The idea wouldn't work for college sports. is kind of asinine. But um, they just don't want to do it. Uh, and most administrators don't like it because they're worried about their jobs. And they know that if players are paid, that the efficient way uh, to spend money is going to be put money to get better on the field or on the court. And then for the, the, the positions that make those on the court better. And make a, they're going to eliminate a lot of these needless administrative positions, just like a bank would eliminate having 100 vice presidents. You don't need all that. Um, and that's one of the reasons they don't want, they don't want to do it. Uh, and, and part of it is, you know, college sports still looks at the money they bring in as their money. And so if a player gets any of it, they're going, wait a minute, we're giving the player our money. And, and it's not their money. Uh, that, that's the problem that they have is they have to wrap their heads around they're running a business here. And now the courts and the government are going to make them run their business the way other American businesses run. And they don't like being told that. Jay Billis of ESPN is on BYU Sports Nation. Jay, if, just a follow-up question there. What, what's an appropriate or realistic timetable to make an adjustment like that? How, how long do you think it would take if the NCAA just said, okay, you can sign these players' contracts and pay them whatever, whenever? Like, how, how long do you think that would take to legally implement and get moving? They could do it tomorrow. They could just say uh, no more restrictions. And – you know, look, it, it, it's really interesting to me that we seem to think this is so difficult because we've always had these restrictive rules on players that violate federal antitrust law. That's, a, that's, that's established. The way the NCAA operates is a cartel which unilaterally uh, places wage restrictions on one class of person, that being the athlete. That's illegal. And they now know that. The Supreme Court has said it. They now know it. If they said tomorrow... Um, you could do it. Uh, you could you could just pay them whatever you want. They would be. It, it would work 
just like it works with hiring an athletic director, hiring a coach or an assistant coach. You know, the, the, the university president and the leadership of BYU isn't sitting up at night going, oh, my God, like, how are we going to run this university? Like, do we pay the landscape professional the same as we put, put, pay the provost? Uh, do we pay the, the secretary of the basketball office the same as we pay Mark Pope? I mean, they work just as hard and they're just as valuable. I mean, what do we do? They, they don't do that. It's not that difficult. And it's funny how, how in no time they could put together a 12-team playoff and sell it for over $8 billion. They figured that out, and they were worried about who's getting what. They could do this tomorrow. It's not that difficult. Follow them on X at Jay Billis. And, Jay, we wish you were with us tomorrow night in the Marriott Center calling Baylor BYU. That's not the case, but you're still very busy. So where can college basketball fans catch you this week? They can hit their mute button on Wednesday night when uh, I'm at uh, I do uh, Duke at Miami, and then I'll be in Texas, Kansas on Saturday. So get the mute button ready. It's it's it's, it's very effective. <laughs> hey, Big Twelve, baby, let's go back in the Big Twelve this weekend. Jay, we appreciate your time. We know how insanely busy you are, uh, and thanks for making some time for us on BYU Sports Nation. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.